happen here, so it should yes. be something we can do. Sorry. Yes. The only thing is the camera. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, so we're going to keep going. We hope that's better now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Basically, um, what, what I've been um, um, saying to start with, maybe, yeah, so, um, is, is just my, you know, my thoughts when I, when I was considering what, what would be a suitable topic. Um, and I decided on not, not uh, um, sort of sharing all the different viruses that we'd found in, in different uh, 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 types of, of, of animals, but actually focus on one that has implications for human health as well as for animal health and is of course also of, of great interest. And I think my, my message for today is that one really needs to work across the spheres in order for things to really gel and make sense. And in a way, uh, Tullio, you know, you, you mentioned so nicely, you know, for, for how long we've been collaborating. It, it all started with HIV. Um, and HIV, of course, was um, and, and today we, we think this is a is a problem which is sort of largely under control, uh, not still, of course, very common and, and, and still people die from it. But I mean, the numbers are, are nowhere close to what they were in the bad old days before treatment became widely available and uh, prevention of mother to child transmission became really effective. Um, and it, so one of the, the, those messages is, of course, that you, you build structures, you build expertise and skills and you set up facilities and then you have them and you can devote them to new topics as they become necessary. And I think the COVID pandemic was a very good example where we could pivot uh, what had been set up largely in terms of networks, but also skilled people, equipment and so on. Uh, that could be pivoted at, at very short notice um, towards the new um, challenge. And, and that, I think, is another uh, important um, lesson to, to, to be learned. Um, just need to move forward. I'm not sure which one controls what. Ah, very good. Yeah. Probably so, here and back. Oh, perfect. Thank you. So let me take you back. Um, what is it now? 60 years or 50 years or something like that? 50 years, I suppose. Um, to to Kashmir, it was not the first drought to to hit the Indian subcontinent, uh, but it was uh, one where it was recognized that with people being forced to use sewage contaminated waters from this river, in this case, uh, for their domestic purposes, including one fears drinking and and cleaning and so on that outbreaks ensued. And in fact, uh, people went back uh, to um, um, archives that were fortunately kept, and that is of course a very rare thing, of samples from an, uh, a similar outbreak of viral hepatitis in the late 1950s in New Delhi, and, and retrospectively could identify that the same problem had occurred there already. Um, and the uh, causative agent was proven to be another uh, hepatitis uh, virus, uh, different from the ones known previously, and because it was the fifth to be discovered, it uh, got the letter E, so there's a viral hepatitis alphabet, R, R, A, B, C, D, which is a helper virus for, 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 for B, and then hepatitis E. And then looking at, at similar scenarios where people are forced to use unsafe water sources, often in uh, in displaced populations that uh, flee from, are forced to flee and, and settle in, 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 in refugee camps uh, because of strife, of, of war, or because of, of, of uh, drought and, and other natural disasters, um, that there had been a long string of, of similar outbreaks. And in fact, there is, is one now ongoing in, in southern Sudan, in South Sudan. So this is not, not come to an end. Um, and that is caused by, by this hepatitis E virus. And what was striking is that uh, relatively young people were becoming infected. So um, somehow there, there isn't sort of universal infection during childhood that then leaves you immune for the rest of your lives. And what's also striking, and that of course goes with infecting uh, uh, young adults and young adults in the best years of their lives, for you still to come, for me in the past, um, the best years, that's also the time when, when ladies tend to be pregnant. And what was striking was the high uh, uh, rate of serious morbidity and high mortality rate in pregnant women. Uh, so, so that can be very uh, devastating up to 
a third of them die. And one of these outbreaks was found actually in our neighboring country um, now 40 years ago in northern Namibia. Um, and there have been subsequent ones in, in Namibia. A similar setting, um, pregnant women uh, suffered most in terms of morbidity and mortality. Um, and the uh, uh, most recent outbreak actually uh, was declared over only relatively recently. It had been ongoing since September 2017. Uh, and I, I take, took these data from a report that WHO and other partners who worked on that um, published at the end in, in, in mid-2021. Uh, so the case fatality rate is relatively low. 66 HEV deaths have been uh, reported. And of course, one, one, are, one questions, you know, how reliable are our denominators? I mean, how do we know how many people became infected? The report also tells us about rapid tests being, being rolled out and being used. But uh, what you see here, and that is typical for these outbreaks in water scares and water problematic settings, is that 41% of the total deaths due to this uh, viral outbreak are maternal deaths. So that's that's uh, uh, pregnant ladies. Um, um, right. Um, and, and these are some of the publications that um, came out of the um, uh, of, of, of that outbreak. And in, in, in fact, one of the or a couple of samples were referred to our lab for sequencing. And Tongai, Dr. Maponga, who's sitting here, thank you for, <laughs> for being here, Tongai, um, sequenced it and found it was HEV genotype 2. So exactly what one thinks it should be two different HEV genotypes occurring under these settings, human-to-human um, -human transmission through fecal contamination, uh, particularly of drinking water. But the pattern is more complicated. There are more than those two HEV genotypes. In fact, we now know of eight. The first four are particularly important, and there is one and two um, that are these the causes of these, of these outbreak scenarios. And there are uh, genotypes three and four that are very different. I, I got this sweet little pig here on the on the screen uh, to remind me to tell you that three and four are zoonotic pathogens. Very different setting, a uh, very different scenario. Another lesson, just because viruses are closely related does not tell you automatically how they will behave ecologically or in causing human disease. So, and that is another challenge that, that we have. Um, we've seen that with other viruses before. I mean, hepatitis C virus being closely related to the flaviviruses, yet totally different mode of transmission, not arthropod-borne, uh, but blood-borne. Um, so these, um, you know, that it's not always that you can clearly deduce from, from, from the genetics as to how the virus should behave epidemiologically and clinically. So, of course, our question is what about South Africa. Um, is, this, is it like this? So what you see here is a hyper endemic. We are, we are uh, ro um, uh, uh, red tinted, so that would mean hyper endemic. And we have a, a red outline around the country which says it should be genotype one. I'm not sure what that is based on because I'm not aware of any genotype one ever having been found in, in, in South Africa. Um, what you see is that uh, Namibia is also indicated as hyperendemic by genotype 2. Now that we, we know is true, the genotype 2 has occurred there um, and probably still does. And then you see that uh, a lot of the global north, but also other uh, temperate countries like Australia and Argentina, um, are, have the green outline. And that means genotype 3. And that indicates there, the predominant uh, viral sub uh, genotype is, is, is three, and that is the, the zoonotic type, and that is linked to, to pork. There were two papers from the 1990s. One has to say that um, the serological methods used at the time were very bad. I myself, in a, in a previous uh, 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 stage of my professional life, uh, tried uh, my luck with some seroepidemiological studies. Um, the, the problem is with these uh, old bad ELISAs, you got one big peak. And then uh, depending on where you set your, your cutoff, you could make them all positive or all negative or something in between. But that's not the two beautifully distinct peaks that we want to see 
uh, when using the serological assay. So the, the tests were nonsense, they were bad, and we've learned a lot since, and, and they have become a, a lot better, fortunately. But those two uh, published papers were basically taken as sort of, this is the situation in South Africa, no need to look any further and leave it at that. Come in, and you see here, uh, uh, Dr. Maponga before he became doctor, because at the time he was doing his studying for his PhD in our division, and his supervisor was Dr. Monique Anderson, who um, left us several years ago to um, to work as an infectious disease specialist in in Oxford, and together with my previous uh, HRD uh, professor Tedder, um, our former PhD student Nafisa Shotun, and um, Prof. Tedder's uh, a colleague, Dr. Ijaz, from the Health Protection Agency in London, whatever that entity is called now. We teamed up and, and they had at that stage an, an interest in hepatitis E, um, genotype 3, being in the UK, being in, in Europe, transmitted uh, and acquired uh, through consumption of pork, but turning out to be a problem in blood transfusion and in medicine. Uh, by uh, through transmission, either from consumption of undercooked pork or common, relatively commonly. I mean, it's a rare event, but it still happens if you receive a lot of transfusions and you are severely immunocompromised of hepatitis E cases in patients undergoing chemotherapy, having had uh, transplants, um, and where, where then hepatitis E is, is, is highly problematic and, and can lead to death. And um, through this, Monique, uh, who had one foot in the lab and one foot in the clinic, uh, made sure that our lab uh, had uh, the serological assays and PCR uh, to offer, but she also kept uh, uh, her eyes open for potential cases. So patients with um, um, hepatic injury uh, who were negative for hepatitis A, B, and C, um, and then so she referred these patients for hepatitis E testing, and this is the first case that she found. It was a 42-year-old uh, HIV-infected male who had his, had his lowest CD4 count at 37 cells, which is, is very low. He commenced ART in March 2010, um, and um, within a few months, so from June onwards, his viral load, HIV viral load was less than 400, so at the time that was, was the goal. So he, he was fully suppressed, his HIV, uh, antiretroviral therapy was working, but at the same time it was noticed that his transaminases or liver enzymes were persistently raised. Um, so in January 2012, he was uh, uh, reviewed by specialists and, you know, the usual risk factors, use of uh, uh, drugs, alcohol and, and other things were, were investigated. Um, the patient wasn't doing badly, um, but but something was not right. Something was affecting his liver, and and that shows again that if you if you left it at that, one would have concluded that it was the HIV medication that was making him sick, and would have changed that, which was as you will see totally unnecessary because that was not the the cause of of the of the liver uh, uh, derangement. Oh, unfortunately, somehow the the slides have. Microsoft managed to, to turn them apart, so the pluses and minuses and the figures are not, not properly done, but at least the curves are still where they should be. So what you see here is the liver, uh, liver um, tests, um, the, the, the dark line here, you see the CD4 count, the, the uh, light gray line, how it uh, increases under antiretroviral therapy, which is indicated by the bar at the bottom. And what you also see is the HEV RNA by PCR, uh, results, uh, quantitative, and the serological results. So the patient started off being serologically negative for hepatitis E virus, but he was positive by PCR. So he was viremic, but he had not mounted an antibody response. And as you then can make out, but you know, sorry, it's it's going over two lines now, um, his uh, HEV hepatitis E viral load really peaked at 1.5 uh, million genome equivalents per milliliter to then come down and finally become negative. At the same time, he zero converted. So the interpretation is that as his immune system kicked in, he was able to mount a response to the hepatitis E infection, which has previously affected him in a chronic fashion, chronically over prolonged periods of time. And again, fortunately in in our lab, we keep all specimens, so we were able to go back and test sa uh, samples from before the problem was realized and manifested itself and already found him HEV 
uh, of our remix. Uh, That's bad. That is the liver enzyme. It basically means there is something affecting the liver. So that was the that was picked up during routine uh, checkups for a patient on antiretroviral therapy. That his liver function uh, tests were. It means when his lipid quite increased, so he has immune system, then then the liver enzyme go down. And Absolutely. In the end, it does. But at first, you see the two almost go hand in hand. Yeah. And, and that is understandable if, if you realize that viral hepatitis is actually uh, immune mediated. So it's actually your own immune system attacking the infected hepatocytes that's giving rise to the uh, signs and symptoms of, of viral hepatitis. So if, you, if your immune system is, is flat, as it was in this gentleman with a very low CD4 count prior to getting onto therapy, um, you are chronically infected, but you're not mounting a response. So Seemingly, everything sounds fine. You don't have acute hepatitis. The acute hepatitis comes when your immune system comes back in and kicks in and then attacks the infected hepatocytes. And of course, with the goal of eliminating the virus, as it did in this case. The second case was somewhat less traumatic. It was a lady who had a renal transplant um, and everything was going well. And then she presented a couple of years later with a history of malaise, fever, nausea, and dark urine. Um, again, other factors were, were, were ruled out. Um, other types of viral hepatitis was, was uh, ruled out, and then she was tested, um, again, for in the blood and in the stool, in the feces, uh, for hepatitis E uh, a genome and, and uh, for antibodies. And you see that um, she also had, an, in this case, acute hepatitis E infection. Um, and uh, with a reduction in the immunosuppressive therapy, which she needs in order to avoid rejection of the donated kidney, um, she cleared the, the, the hepatitis E virus infection. So that was, in a way, less traumatic. But what it shows, and this is why I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this, is that these are the first well-documented cases of hepatitis E disease in South Africa, um, which previously, and I, I mentioned those studies, it was sort of deemed to be not really a, an entity worth mm -hmm. investigating further. Um, so what we found is, is firstly, it causes disease. Um, if you, you know, if, if you look for it, you, you, you might find cases that otherwise would have been ascribed to something else. Very interesting, it's also the first cases that were genotyped in the country, and they both turn out to be HIV genotype 3, and they clustered genetically with the European and Japanese strains previously uh, uh, sequenced. Um, so they clearly differed from the previously described uh, uh, outbreaks and cases uh, in other parts of Africa. Um, and it sort of made sense in that there had been one or two uh, early reports of finding HEV genotype 3 in pigs in, in, in Africa, but never before in human beings. So this is where our, uh, our virus um, sat, and these are already uh, Tongai's uh, sequences here in, 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 in the tree. What's also, of course, important is that um, we still have, even though the, the situation is clearly improved since then, so there are fewer people with uncontrolled HIV disease, but still that, that does occur. And we had the patient who, who had chronic uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, because of, of, of basically no, no, no sizable immune system, so no, no inability to mount a response. Um, the same can happen with other viruses that usually cause acute and, and transient infections like hepatitis E. So our patient, the HIV patient, was positive by, for RNA for more than six months. Now, of course, one doesn't know when it started. One could have, you know, if, if samples had been available, it also, also de always depends on how, what, where do you have samples and, and do you have samples from that. Um, and um, keeping in mind that there is such a, uh, an enormously large population of HIV in infected people in South Africa, this may simply be a problem that is largely underestimated. And one wonders how many people have their HIV medications changed needlessly when, in fact, the reason for their liver derangement uh, may be hepatitis E infection. In fact, you don't want to change it if it's working. You want to keep it up because it's the patient's immune response that needs to kick in cause hopefully transient uh, liver derangement, but then clears the virus. 
Um, so it's it's uh, we found that and and we we also describe uh, you know I think in a very nice uh, um, you know demonstration um, that immune reconstitution hepatitis occurs as the CD4 count uh, recovers the patient's immune system uh, comes back in and ultimately clears HEV um, from 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 the from the system that uh, similar things have been described in transplant recipients. Now, basically, the, the message here is that you want HIV patients being treated effectively. I mean, that is the ultimate bottom line that, you know, you want people, you don't want people to live, having to live with uh, immunological uh, deficiency uh, of a severe nature if it can be treated. And of course, that, that message has many, many benefits, so it, but it also has a benefit in avoiding those, um, those cases. Next question is, were these freak? cases or how common is it? Uh, so, of course, our clinician colleagues uh, from infectious diseases, hepatology, they they started and have kept looking for, for cases and found many more, of course. But in, in addition, um, Dr. Maponga supervised two uh, students who uh, used blood uh, donor samples uh, for to, to elucidate the epidemiology. Now, blood donors are, of course, the opposite of patients, of, of hospital patients. So hospital patients are those who are really sick. Blood donors are those who are really healthy and don't have any uh, risk factor at all. Uh, I'm not sure who, who donates blood. I do. So I always joke. It's a joke, of course. But on the, the three page questionnaire, you know, there's at least two things where I need to lie in order just to be eligible to donate because they're very strict about risk factors and this and that. Um, so you, you must have a very clean lifestyle and not travel and not do things uh, in order to be allowed to donate blood. And of course, the blood donations are also checked for a number of, of, of things. So there's a very high level of, of safety. So if you find um, if you use blood donors, that is not an estimate of what's happening in the general population. They are pre-selected in terms of age groups and, and health status. But if you find it there, you can you can just expect there would be even more in other groups where you don't have sort of the the uh, you know the purging of, of those with, with more risk factors. And basically the, the finding was that HIV infection is very common in, in the Western Cape blood donor population. And um, I, I always joke about John Guy luckily going up to 10,000 blood donors for, for testing because the 10,000, of course, one of them, not necessarily the last one, was HIV RNA positive. Now, why do we want to know? So it was not all just indicative of past infection, which is already an, a, a relevant finding, but one was actively infected. And the importance of that is, of course, that then you have something to sequence and to determine which genotype it is. And bingo, it was genotype 3 uh, once again. So we basically have shown it. Of course, you can't, serologically, you can't tell what genotype had infected the patient in order to become seropositive. But taking these data together, so it's only genotype 3 that we've ever found in, in people uh, locally here in South Africa. And that's the one associated with Europe. Exactly. So, so, so should we do a travel ban on that? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. It, I think, Dave, it, it's, it's happened already. And I think in this case, it wasn't so much people, uh, but it was the pigs that they brought in. So what I assume is that as domestic pigs got taken uh, around the world, um, that they brought in, in most cases, or many cases, HEV genotype 3 with. So that was now the next study, and that was done by our colleague from the provincial uh, veterinary services, um, Dr. Leslie van Helden. Um, she did that as a as a master's uh, project uh, in in Edinburgh, and she looked at pig farms supplying the uh, Western Cape, so commercial pig farms. Um, and, and she tells me that some of the farms she can't go back to, so she did not endear herself to the farmers. <laughs> and you know, you know, they're very, I mean, they, they're edgy because they don't want more trouble and more stuff, but others were very forthcoming and, and easy. And, and basically what she found is that there is a lot of hepatitis E in our local pig farms. So again, it's, it's quite clear where this is probably coming from 61 percent of the of the almost thousand uh, pig samples were, were positive so they had been infected during you know in the course of their relatively short lives before they get eaten um, and that is also um, since similar 
um, uh, uh, figures have emerged from other African countries, so it's not uh, uh, limited to, to South Africa. Um, there wasn't a single farm where there weren't any infected pigs, but she also correlated, and there's a lot of things to, to learn, which also, you know, is way beyond my understanding, the way this pig farming business works. So it's not a not like an idyllic thing with a little pig being born and then a year later you decide to have it as a spit pie. But you know, they get shipped for different stages of their of their lives. And depending on how that is done, so the husbandry techniques also determine the risk of infection. Um, but it is basically ubiquitous and it's 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 very common. And it is the wild conceivable that not all pigs would be you know, would have had infection in the past by the time they get slaughtered, but there would also be some that are currently infected while they get eaten, or I mean, be, be just before when they get slaughtered and then eaten. And there is a, a study by colleagues of ours from, from UCT um, that uh, looked at uh, pig-derived uh, food products that they bought in, in stores in, in, in Cape Town, and they could find that uh, some of these were HEV RNA positive. So you can basically buy it. And that's a similar story to those countries like the UK, France, and so on, where people have looked, you know, how do people, uh, may, uh, humans become infected? And genetically, these are also the same strains that infect human beings. So message here is please cook or buy your pork very carefully. Don't eat it raw. Um, and again, don't do what I say, don't do as I do, because when I was at the, the, the meeting recently, including some people uh, working on HEV in, in, in Germany, that is very wonderful um, raw pork um, 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 stuff. I, I absolutely love it. Uh, and I, because the others are very reluctant, so I had like more than my, my share. And I said, why aren't you eating any of this? I presume this has all been tested, isn't it? As it, oh gosh, I think I've had it before, so don't worry. But um, so, you know, that is how people probably get it. The vast majority of people will not have any ill effects from that. So it, there's a lot of silent infections. Few people will recall any episode of significant viral hepatitis. Um, but of course, if that should hit you while you are uh, temporarily or permanently immunocompromised, that can become a big, big problem. And also, you know, if you planning to donate blood, you know, that is also, of course, something when, which is impossible to avoid because the incubation period is several weeks. So, I mean, you wouldn't know by the time you donate what you ate within the next, uh, within the past six weeks and whether you could currently be positive. So what we do know now is that HIV infection is common in Western Cape. It's genotype three. It's uh, linked to pigs and pork. Of course, a lot more detail needs to be uh, thrashed out on that. There is a risk of serious disease in immunocompromised patients, very much like in the industrialized countries. And it's a, a likely underestimated cause of acute viral hepatitis. But as we describe those cases and establish the, the, the lab methods routinely in our NHLS lab, and of course also share these results, uh, our clinical colleagues have also started looking for it more. And that is of course also valuable. And so we are finding cases um, and, you know, it, it, and this is not not going into an area where before people would not have looked. It was people did look. And of course, they would have looked for hepatitis A. They would have looked for hepatitis B. They would have looked for other causes that could could affect the liver. Um, but hepatitis E was not on the on the menu. It was not available and it was thought not to play a role. And then, you know, one settles for a different type of of, of diagnosis. So things can be there and we have no reason to believe any of this is new. This has probably been going on for many decades, if not longer. Um, but um, and you look at the, the seroprevalence in the blood donors that increases with age. So clearly you have a certain risk per, per year of presumably consuming pork, but possibly also other modes of transmission. Um, but if you don't look, you won't find, you You would not see this. And I think that we have the same situation with uh, viral CNS infections where a large proportion of uh, presumed cases never have an etiology attached to it. So, um, so there is a, you know, there's a lot of illness out there that occurs. Mild illness is more difficult because people don't seek health care. And if they do, it's not deemed to warrant a test. And you know, a very limited repertoire of tests only. It's also a question of investment uh, and access to, to healthcare, but even more serious um, 
technical illness may well not be diagnosed simply because the test is not available, there's no awareness, and one just then ends up with a certain proportion that has an undis unclear cause. And, you know, if it's, if it's self sort of uh, limiting, then, you know, it'll, it'll go away. And whatever you assumed it was and were trying to treat, you know, looks like it was successful. Um, so there, there is a lot lurking out there and there is virtue in, in knowing. Uh, of course, the vast majority can have their hepatitis E infection, genotype 3, and not, you know, not, not be in any way affected in a, in a serious manner, but there will be cases uh, amongst them um, that should avoid it if, if they get a chance. So there are many things that we still don't know. The first one is, um, is there any other way than by eating undercooked or raw pork um, that would, or maybe close contact with pigs um, that could infect you? And one big question is, what about sewage and sewage uh, or manure contaminated water? Used directly, fortunately, not so common in the Western Cape, but uh, of course it's used for irrigation. So what, what about the salad? Now for the carnivores, that's a nice excuse to stay away from the salads because it could have been. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, we, we, we don't know that. Um, and then the other question is, are there any, any, any other animals that we need to, to, to look at? Uh, in Europe, it's uh, domestic pigs and it's also wild boar that are important uh, reservoirs of hepatitis E. And there are also there is a risk of infection. So people who go out and hunt and then butcher these, these uh, wild boar that are tasty, um, they, they have an increased risk of getting infected. And there are guidelines on how to do that safely. So by a bit of biosecurity uh, when, when you know, uh, butchering these, these cases. In addition, about 10 years ago, there was a first report or two uh, of a new variant of hepatitis E virus uh, from Hong Kong. Um, that was a rat hepatitis E virus. And to be honest, I didn't make much of it. I thought this is very obscure and far, far away. I have now understood better. Um, and in fact, people have started looking for it. The problem is that most of our diagnostic tests that are established and are used more and more, uh, routinely would not necessarily capture that. So, um, and in fact, it is a different species of hepatitis E virus. So you need to test for it specifically. And as people are starting to do that, we see more and more papers coming out describing case areas, uh, for example, from uh, Spain from, from last year. So the question is, now that we've we got on, to, on top of hepatitis E, at least clinical cases, we can diagnose them. Is there a variant hepatitis E that may still be occurring that we would still miss? And um, yeah, that is our, oops, here we are. I now briefly go into three uh, student projects of ours. One is concluded, uh, the supervisor is, is Tonga Maponga. Um, this is Palmin Roberts who, uh, uh, um, got her master's at the end of last year and she was looking in wastewater. Now this is the offspin of the wastewater epidemiology that we became involved with uh, in the in the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. And, uh, and and COVID of course is, 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 is SARS-CoV-2 is far more far-fetched for from the wastewater epidemiology point of view because it's a respiratory virus. So which still ends up in sufficient amounts in the in the, in the wastewater um, and is surprisingly, even though it is an envelope virus, is stable enough to, um, to last so that its genome can be picked up in the wastewater. And you know, you've probably come across some of these uh, papers already. So it's, it's, it's now more and more widely used. Hepatitis E wouldn't be a surprise to find the wastewater. Uh, ultimately, we know that genotypes one and two are transmitted through fecally contaminated water. It's a non-envelope virus. So like hepatitis A, it's exactly the type of thing that we expect in the wastewater. It infects the liver, it's shed through the bile, gets into the gut, and of course it is passed in high amounts uh, at the other end. Um, so uh, Bonwin was uh, looking for it, and, and this is, is sort of the setting. This is the MRC colleagues um, doing the wastewater surveillance here in the uh, Cape Town metropole and, and uh, some locations outside. And in addition, um, there was also the, um, the, uh, the, the residences on our campus and on Stellenbosch campus uh, whose wastewater we also tested during the COVID outbreak. Um, so Bonvin also included some samples from that, and then she did PCR and she uh, she sequenced the uh, the 
positive samples, and that is what she found. So it is, yeah, it's quite a lot, and, and that was only a selection. So, uh, and she found sort of many, you know, quite a substantial number of positives. Uh, the CT values, you know, they sort of correlate inversely with with the viral loads are, are quite quite high. So, you know, not a lot of it, as we would expect. Um, um, but and and of course, there's always the question of sensitivity. You know, and I mean, how many patients would have would need to shed hepatitis E actively at a given point in time in order not to be out diluted by everything else that goes down into the wastewater stream, including all the products from the non-infected people and also everything else, our shower water and, and so on. So, um, you know, that, but but ultimately it was a proof of concept. It can be found um, and uh, the uh, so hepatitis E virus occurs in wastewater. And that means it can also uh, presumably end up in uh, contaminated rivers uh, that are fecally contaminated. Um, and if wastewater services are not, not functioning, are not functioning well and could therefore also go onto onto uh, um, you know into irrigation water and um, so those are the the, the residences and the, the uh, wastewater treatment works um, and that is uh, nicely the epidemiological the, the molecular epidemiology of, of of these cases so you know it's the same genotypes that you that we've previously found in in human beings, as one would expect. So that is what we have here. And finding it in wastewater basically indicates that there's ongoing transmission and ongoing infections happening. So um, I think this is, this is a bit too long. Now the picture is getting more complicated. The zoo of hepatitis E viruses is growing and, and expanding. So, um, and of course, uh, you, you're maybe aware that the ICTV, the International Committee for the Taxonomy of Viruses, has really complicated matters. Uh, very, uh, uh, in an unfriendly manner, they have done so before I retire. I mean, it would have been much more reasonable to wait another 10 years so that this passes me by and I stick with the old nomenclature, which I had all my work life. No, they changed it. So now we have a, a system very much like in the rest of, of, of species with, with spe uh, genus and species names. So the species is Autohepavirus A, uh, also known as Passler hepavirus, uh, and these are the genotypes that I mentioned. HEV, oh, I must, I must stay here. HEV1 and 2 are those, the outbreak uh, ones in, in, uh, in water scare settings, HEV3 and also HEV4, which is less common uh, globally, are the zoonotic ones, and then there are another four um, that also some of them have been found in human beings in a small number. But you know the question is always how well do people look, and also in different types of animals. So there is an is a growing zoo of viruses, but there is also importantly um, the um, where, where is that now the HEVC1. I don't have a I can't get the mouse to work. Um, you see that under Autohepavirus C. HVC1, that is the rat uh, uh, hepatitis E virus, also known as Roca hepavirus, whereas ours, the autohepavirus A, is known as Pasla hepavirus. So all these fancy tongue breaker uh, names, difficult for Germans to pronounce. So the question is, in this recent review, is, um, you know, what what are our, you know, how do, how do people become infected? Um, you know, we, we know some of these uh, pathways. Uh, you can get it from domestic or wild boars directly. Uh, you can get it through eating eating them. You can have it from other human beings through blood transfusion. Question is drinking water. What about the environment if that is contaminated? And what about other species? So, you know, there's still a lot that we need to to tease out, even though we, we think that we know, you know, it's the, the majority of cases are probably accounted for by what, what we know already. So this is a is a is a paper of uh, that, that is the first paper to describe the new Roca hepaviruses that later became their own uh, uh, species of hepatitis E virus in in wild rats, and as I mentioned, ever since people have looked both in different types of rodents and small carnivores, but also in human beings increasingly with suitable tests which are not commercially available. So always. You can only do this in 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 in, uh, uh, in research settings um, and find more and more of them. But it is really the big picture is still quite unclear. So as as to how important they are, is it relevant or not? 
And um, we, we, we want to, to look at this. And um, this is a PSC Honors project um, by a PSC Honors student of ours. I don't think she is here. Oh, no. hmm. They have lectures, yeah, of course. Honor students have lectures for them. Um, she's going to use the uh, small mammal samples, particularly the rodent and shrew samples that we uh, have uh, in our uh, bank from our previous uh, uh, projects to look for evidence of ROCA and also Pasla hepaviruses, so both species of, of hepatitis E virus, to see whether there is. And then, of course, if, if she finds any, then to home in onto these uh, uh, phylogenetic groups of, of rodents. So Ratus is is a, is a obviously you know has been found in different settings to carry them, but we don't really know about all those wild um, uh, feral uh, rodents and shrews that live in South Africa. Some of which have very close connection to humans. I mean they they follow humans and. You know, I mean, I found a dead rat in my, my garden yesterday. Um, so, and that's only the dead one. It did, I don't think it did, it died from hepatitis E. No, I didn't, I didn't bring it. So it ended up on the compost heap. But so we, we do share our, you know, and we do share our, our habitations with, uh, with, with rodents. So that could be a potentially important. And of course, one other aspect is, um, what about um, the, the sewage? I mean, do we also find Roca hypervirus in these uh, wastewater samples? Another fascinating question is, what about the wild boars and, and domestic pigs, closest relatives in, in Africa? Very widespread species is, is the, are the warthogs. And Miss uh, Sally, our master's student, uh, whose slides I'm also going to show you, some of, of, of which, uh, who's just started her MSc study with us. She's going to look at warthog samples that we have access uh, uh, to through our collaboration with um, the colleagues uh, at the uh, Animal TB unit uh, and Sun Park's uh, um, biobank in, in Kruger National Park. Fascinating. So there are samples that these brave field rangers collect whenever they get hold of an animal, um, risking their lives. I mean, these, they make a very nasty, nasty teeth sticking out. So you don't want to get on the wrong side of these pigs. Um, and we, we uh, and and Sarah is going to test them for evidence of uh, antibodies or so, uh, zero epidemiological study using a suitable ELISA, which of course needs to have a proper conjugate, which would detect also antibodies from a different species, but not, not humans. Um, and uh, if she finds positive, she'll also uh, test for, for viral RNA as well as in other types of samples like uh, um, fecal, fecal samples and, and organs from these warthogs. So what I wanted to do is just give you a sort of a, a bit of a, a, a overview going back sort of 15 years, it is almost, uh, to, to see that that's something that is very widespread and does occasionally cause significant clinical disease, can go unrecognized. And you need to pull in, firstly, you need to, to, to have the tests available. Then you need to uh, get the clinical colleagues aware that this is it, it, it exists here and it may be relevant. So they start referring, uh, you know, uh, patient samples for, for these tests. And then you need to try and, and put the bigger picture together. And that involves then working with people in other specialties, wastewater, um, animal health, veterinary services, uh, wildlife services, to, to get really a, a comprehensive uh, or better not it's probably still not going to be comprehensive but a better view of of what's happening um so thank you very much particularly to the colleagues whose data i presented largely uh, tongai and the students over the uh, different years and uh, yeah maybe in two years time one of them will present what we found so thank you Great. yeah thank you very much Wolfgang. yeah and, and normally this this we have one of these big seminars every every month yeah and one of our jobs as participants it is to ask lots of questions and lots of difficult questions to our presenter in a way that go back and forward yeah so for people online if you can think about difficult or interesting questions for <laughs> professor wolfgang fraser and for here people in the room yeah yeah johan oh, yeah. Um, 
not a leader. <laughs> I always have an issue. I can't see. Spot on. First question, full hit. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the problem is when, when doing these things, so the, those early cases from 2011, uh, you know, the, the, the problem is how, how you know, you, you need to look what other people have sequenced. So this was before the time of whole genome sequencing. I mean, you know, it, it existed, but it was far more complicated and, and everything. Anything from now on is, and I refer to Tongai for, for details on that, is going to be uh, a full genome sequenced. And of course, that will reveal far more uh, information. So that, that's, that's always a, a challenge, but that is, I think, is the bad old days of, of molecular virology almost, because we've really moved beyond that. When you you sometimes we had we had uh, um, sequences that that were not usable because there was nobody else that that had that and therefore you, there's nothing to compare it to or it's very sketchy. I mean you saw also that the, the trees you know they're, they're very thin branches you know it's a, it's a long branch and then it's just two two twigs at the end but that's simply because that there may have been an outbreak in the 1980s and 90s and so nobody ever ever got any sequences out of that. Um, so, but I think that's a that's a problem of the past, uh, and I think going forward there will just be a profusion of full length or near full length sequences. So I, I think that can only get a lot better. But here I can defend my my friend and colleague Tonga. Yeah, because <laughs> if you look at this phylogenetic tree, yeah, it is they they have select the right genomic region. Eh? Yeah. It's very clear. Diversification between genotype one, long branchland, genotype two, mm. genotype three, and genotype four. Yeah, and you can also see all the Western case samples together. It's suggesting a kind of local continuous outbreak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and of yeah. So I mean, yeah, no, it's it 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 is a super. I mean, also it's. It, Relatively easy to do. I mean, Sanger sequencing, uh, a stretch. So that is that is 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 um, is is absolutely the right place. And you also got that. Uh, you can you can you can link that to the human cases for whom you've got sequences. So they would also fit fit in nicely. Still, I I I agree that you know in, going forward it'll be full sequences. <laughs> Another great question. So Yes, among the blood donors, and of course they don't ask for for religion, but you know, but there were differences between the the the, the Western Cape population groups that make one think that there are influences in terms of what people eat, but also what people, I mean, eat for for, for religious reasons, but also what what they can afford, you know, and how much of it. So you know that is is one question, and that was distinct from hepatitis A, which was interesting. So hepatitis A is a, is a human virus, a human to human transmission through poor hygiene, um, and that was exactly as one would expect. So the, the poorer you are, the more likely you are to, to be exposed to bad hygienic circumstances, um, you know, sharing tap and, and the toilet with many other families and much more likely to pick it up early on. Hepatitis E is different, and so the con 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 uh, consumption pattern of, of, of pork um, seems to play into it. We haven't got a, um, um, a study plan that, you know, will, for example, would look at, at Muslim or Jewish populations that don't eat pork. And I'm also not sure how, you know, that one would have to go quite in, into detail to, to do that. 
um, might be worth it because that would then possibly filter out those um, maybe relatively rarer transmission pathways that are not acquired by a pork. That is the other thing, yeah. So another question that, that really uh, uh, bothers me is, so we have genotype 2 in Namibia, and there was a lot of it uh, recently in the recent past. What about genotype 3 there? I mean, do they also, and, and one would have to start looking at, at pork consumption and the whole big industry in, in Namibia uh, first, but is there any cross protection? So one could think that maybe that's the reason why we don't have these outbreaks. I mean, we have cholera. I mean, we have many bad things and there is many places where sewage is not safely handled and many people who still don't have access to safe, proper water. Um, would they possibly be protected by having had pork acquired hepatitis uh, E genotype 3 infection previously and then can't get the other ones? I don't know. Um, do you remember that uh, mentioning that the vaccine um, that that is, that is available? I read a recent paper and I have to follow up on that. That in in an animal model, it did not confer immunity to hepatitis E infection being vaccinated. So the question is, you know, even though serologically we can't distinguish them, uh, whether these antibodies are cross, you know, confer cross immunity. And I, I'm not aware of of any anything to any study looking at somebody who had hepatitis E genotype 3 previously, whether they could get the other one. So there is a lot still to be found out and to be understood better. Yeah. Very good question. I'm so maybe I repeat the question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The, the question was about the, the right type of sample uh, for animals and um, for human beings, uh, blood, feces, uh, liver samples, and, and others. Um, there are studies uh, looking at the secretion pattern, particularly in, in, in pigs, because they can be killed and it's easier, so humans, but also there's to a limited degree, there is, it's known in humans. Um, but the other question is, what do we get and what do we have? So it, it just so happens that the usual sample material that comes to our lab, and is also often uh, taken and then uh, stored for, for veterinary labs, is, is blood. So this is why we, we look in blood. In order to optimize our finding of, of genotypes of the actual virus, I would prefer liver samples and or fecal samples because we know this is where the virus is shed and the viremia is relatively short lived. So you must be lucky to to, you know, get a sample from that short period. If you could get uh, properly stored fecal samples or, or liver samples, it would probably make it easier, but they are very difficult to to get by. In humans, because it's invasive and people don't think of of, of uh, fecal samples for that because the patient is, is yellow, you know, that it's not a it's not a gut, apparently not a gut problem. So but you're absolutely right for for our um, genotyping. Uh, it would be much preferable these, to have these other other uh, sample types. Yeah, yeah, Monica, I hope you're there. People. Thank you so much for a really interesting talk. I learned a lot about this virus. Um, if I caught it correctly, the master's project was a, with the wastewater surveillance was a proof of concept. So I was wondering if there are any other um, investigations with the wastewater across the country looking at prevalence to kind of investigate if there's regional differences um, or demographic group differences. Um, if not, would you anticipate any kind of differences in your opinion? Yeah, that is very. Thank you for the for the question. So the uh, um, oh yeah, the people, audience has heard it. Yeah, I hope so. Okay. <laughs> so the the question about the wastewater uh, surveillance and, and in other parts of the country, um, colleagues from University of Pretoria are starting it, and in fact, Tongai has supplied them with the I think the positive control it was, and the the plasmid. 
um, to help them along. So this this will be will be done. What I would really like to do, but that is technologically sort of technically more challenging because it's even more diluted than in, in normal sewage is to look in in contaminated waters so water bodies like like rivers with fecal contamination we already are at a CT of 37 38 so it's you know it's at the at the upper end so you know how much you know what what else we would we need to do in order to to really concentrate the the virus from these surface waters so that that would pose challenges but I think that would be really interesting to see how much is there is there at all and and if if how much how much there is because that is what would link to you know people becoming infected again or even animals I mean could also be okay yeah we we have one question online okay or two questions yeah so so you mentioned that pork from shops were tested and found to be hepatitis E positive did you limit this to just certain shop groups regarding the price range or this was done in all price ranges? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's important. Just yeah, yeah, no, it like, is. Yeah. Uh, but you, you see, there was a, I, I remember the discussions at the time. I mean, Dr. Korsman, who was the lead uh, uh, investigator there, is a former registrar of ours. And I remember him asking, so do I actually need to get ethics? And I thought, no, if they sell you the stuff, I think they sort of, they, you know, it's it's for your consumption. So I think you are, it's in, you're perfectly right. It's in your right to actually test it for anything that might impair your, your health when you consume it. So I don't think you need ethics or you need to have consent from the shop. I'm not aware. I think this is, uh, but it's of course very treacherous territory. In fact, I... I'm aware of the UK studies that one particular supermarket chain, which is well known to people who've been to the UK, but I shall not say the name, um, lest I be sued for millions of UK pounds, um, it has been has a much higher rate than others. And that's apparently linked to where they source their pork from. So I, to be honest, I don't know. In order to protect me as a witness, so that I could not uh, announce anything, he never shared those details with us. Thank you. And the um, and the other question, I don't think that's going to get you in any legal trouble. Yeah. Oh. So thank you for this interesting conference. I learned a lot. I wish to know. Apart from hepatitis E, which other virus did, did you find in the wastewater, or which other virus are normally uh, the virology department involved in wastewater uh, surveillance? For us, it's a new. Uh, I, I mean, the, the, traditionally in 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 I mean in in virology, we for decades always look for for polioviruses. I mean, polio surveillance is how that whole wastewater story started, and of course that's a no-brainer because that is it's also an enteric virus, so this is where it is shed and this is where you find it, and that goes back many decades, and of course long before people did PCR, so they were culturing it from the from the wastewater. So enteric viruses have been looked at. Um, but we really started with with COVID. We would not need to venture into into polio because there is well you know run programs on on polio surveillance and certification and so on. So that's happening already. Um, what I personally am am interested in apart from hepatitis E and particularly Roca hepavirus, whether we find evidence of that and looking in samples other than proper sewage, you know, sort of contaminated waters, uh, would be the uh, other respiratory viruses. So influenza, RSV and so on. So if we, if we have SARS-CoV in the, in, the, in, the, in the wastewater, we should also have the other viruses. And it, I, I presume it is because they infect our upper and lower respiratory tract. We cough them up, we sneeze them, and we swallow the stuff and it passes through. What's amazing is that it is so, you know, the genome, I mean, it's not an infection question. These viruses are dead in the water. I mean, they are not going to infect anybody. Unlike, of course, hepatitis A, E, and and polio virus. I mean, that is that is stable for for months in the in the, in the wastewater. Um, but but those respiratory viruses, they will be they probably won't survive the the gut passage because of the the bile and the and the stomach acid and so on. Uh, but uh, amazingly, uh, it seems that their genomes survive the journey and can be picked up at the at the other end. Um, which really opens fascinating uh, insights potentially that needs to be investigated uh, into uh, what's happening in the population, particularly that gray zone where 
there is a lot of illness, but it's not serious enough in most patients to to really warrant a, a test. You know, I mean, there's a lot of respiratory illness that's sort of um, mild. Um, so what sticks out are the few seri clinically serious cases. They are likely to get to get tested, but we don't really know what's happening and how much of it. Um, because people don't get tested for it. So and I think this is something that uh, wastewater could potentially fill, that, that it's a gap. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, there is a lot of discussion um, now in the aftermath of the of the pandemic uh, about the role and you know contribution of wastewater epidemiology. Was it really that helpful? How to correlate it? So in the at the beginning, people were promising a lot. So we can see, oh, there's a peak is building up. So in two weeks' time, uh, hospitals will be very busy with with COVID patients. Of course, that's no longer the case because most people have had it a couple of times and are therefore relatively protected from severe disease. So, you know, what does it really tell us? How do we correlate um, the quantity in the wastewater uh, with a number of clinical cases? And that's that's complicated. Uh, so there's a lot lot that still needs to be found out. Okay, so, so, so the last question for you, as you see, we like to grill the presenters. So we, yeah, even now, 10 minutes past the talk, we have 75 participants online. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, and, and the last question is from Kotsu. What are the current gaps in knowledge regarding the nature of natural history and long term outcomes of hepatitis infection in South Africa, both in the human population and zoonosis? And how can longitudinal cohort studies help to address these gaps? Yeah, I think the, uh, the the questions are firstly how much clinically significant illness is still there and not getting recognized as such, and I think that might still well still be the case. And you know, it's 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 worrying if you think of people who have some liver dysfunction and then are presumed to have drug toxicity, and uh, the TB or HIV drugs are changed when in fact it's something else. So you know, it's, there there may be implications beyond hepatitis. Um, so we don't really have a good handle of, of you know, and, and of course it's notifiable, but it's only, it only works for cases that get diagnosed. So if you don't diagnose in the first place, you know, there's nothing to notify. So we don't really count those. And the other uh, question for, for me is really the, the transmission pathways. Is there something like, you know, is, is water, is contaminated water, unsafe water and, and maybe via produce? Uh, is that really uh, significant? Is that something to worry about? Is that something that one needs to, for example, warn patients who are immunocompromised? There will always be patients that are immunocompromised because their treatment isn't working or that are iatrogenically com immunocompromised because of you know, immunosuppressive therapy, which they need. You know, what, what do we advise people? So, I mean, clearly one would not advise to, to consume any undercooked uh, or raw meat like, don't be stupid, like a virologist, don't eat the raw stuff, even if it's, if it's tasty, you know, because you, you run into many more problems than hepatitis, of course. There could be all sorts of nasty stuff lurking. But beyond that, you know, is there anything, any advice that we need to give? And I don't think we, we know that. The other question, and that's quite speculative at the, at the moment, but Rochelle is, is going to look at this, is do we also have uh, hepatitis E related viruses in other types of animals that could also infect humans. Um, so where we start from scratch, you know, is it common? Is it not common? One is only trying to find out in in some other settings. It's it's at the very beginning this whole field. Um, so yeah, I think those are the main questions at the moment. Thank you so much, And uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Thanks so much, Wolfgang. And and just to highlight that what Wolfgang highlighted, the, the importance of respiratory virus and how to track, just to highlight you that this Friday at midday to one, and we have the information in our newsletter, we have a colleague that come from the Welcome Sanger Institute. He's the head of, 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 of uh, respiratory